All right, our next storyteller is Lou Rochelle Brim Atkins. Ms. Lou Rochelle. Ms. Lou Rochelle has been an innovative consultant, executive coach, facilitator, educator, and trainer for over three decades. She attended an all black school in Texas founded by her grandparents, completed her undergraduate studies in the South, completed graduate school in the East and West. She lived in the Northwest. She has lived in the Northwest since 1972 and has traveled to 32 countries and several multiple times. Best known for her critical analysis, creativity, humor, and her ability to build consensus in her consulting practice, Brim Donahue and Associates, Lou Rochelle partners with Fortune 100 companies, nonprofit organizations, and government agencies to help them achieve organizational breakthroughs. She weaves storytelling into her work in race and social justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Lou Rochelle is a global diversity practitioner, has taught public K-12 school and in universities. She is masterful in presenting interactive, inspirational keynotes and workshops for adults as well as younger audiences. Traveling with others, Lou Rochelle leads joint ventures, sustainable projects, I'm sorry, joint venture sustainable projects in Africa for clean water, libraries, and feminine care products. She is a published author and was recently featured in the book, We Will Lead Africa, Everyday African Leadership Stories. Ms. Lou Rochelle. Thank you, Noni. I am so pleased to be here with all of these amazing writers. Um, and I tonight have decided that I wanted to share with you my Where I Am From poem. And I wanna give you just a little background of these poems. They were first created, the format was first created by George Ella Lyons. And it, it was her response to a poem in a book titled, Stories I Ain't Told Nobody Yet by Joe Carson. And where I am from, where I'm from poems are, I think a testimony to the power of poetry. Uh, power of roots and sharing who you are with the world. Uh, and I'm encouraging you to write some of these poems your first by making a where I am from list, and then you edit your list into a poem. There are some forms online that you can Google, the source of all knowledge, uh, and get a format for how to write your own poem, and you'll have so much fun. Uh, you can use those poems as a map for other writing journeys. Uh, there are things that I wish I had asked my parents and my grandparents when they were alive. Um, so I encourage you, if you still have family members who are older than you, to talk with them about their lives and use that as a format for writing your own Where I Am From poem. Uh, you can talk about the things you ate or still eat or the books that were important to you, or the important people in your life, the music you love, what you were thinking and feeling at significant points in your life. The possibilities are endless. You can ask your family members to write their Where I Am From poems, uh, to read at family reunions. You'll be surprised at the things you can learn about people that you think you already know. If you're a teacher, you can get young people interested in writing poetry using this format. We have used it in our travels to Africa with some of the delegates who have written their own Where I Am From poems. So your poem, you know, will be brilliant because you are the expert on you. And no one sees the world the way that you do. No one else has your material to draw on. And you don't have to know where to begin. Just start writing your list and go from there. So I'm going to share my Where I Am From poem with you. <clears throat> I'm from a segregated small town in Northeast Texas in the United States of America a stop on the highway with one stoplight where a few bothered to stop, a town where we knew we had to mind the Negro adults, all of whom did their best to keep us safe from the white folks. I'm from a birth in a black hospital in Arkansas where my cousin was a physician. I was born in the wrong state because the German American doctor in my parents' Louisiana hometown deliberately dropped black boy babies at birth, including my older brother, who suffered all his life as a result, 
suffered from grand mal epilepsy and cognitive challenges that shrouded his brilliance, all because one white doctor made a decision to be a murderer. I'm still trying to find the kinfolk of that doctor to see what they know about him. I am from fed on the grain we grew chicks that we knew we couldn't get attached to because even as children, we knew those chicks would soon become chickens that we would slaughter in the backyard and eat for Sunday dinner. I'm from corn picked fresh from our gardens and eaten on the cob, purple hull peas shelled on the front porch and green beans snapped soon thereafter. I'm from collard, turnip and mustard greens Beefsteak tomatoes ripen on the vine, lima beans and okra picked in the hot Texas sun, all before we knew that everything we were eating was organic. I'm from cornbread and pot liquor, fresh churned buttermilk, watching in awe as the butter floated to the top. I am from wild blackberry cobblers made from berries picked fresh off our vines. Peach cobblers from peaches picked fresh off our trees. I am from German chocolate and pound cakes, yeast rolls and pecan pies at Christmas, from apple pies created in the dead of night by my maternal grandparents who loved each other's thoughts and loved spending that quiet middle of the night time baking and eating pie together. I am from gardens fertilized by cow manure that we carried in wheelbarrows from the pasture across the highway up the hill so that as my grandmother would say, we could grow food for the neighbors, some for the birds and some for ourselves. I always thought the neighbors could plant their own gardens. God would feed the birds and I wouldn't have to do all that harvesting and canning all summer. Of course, those thoughts were never formed into words to be uttered by my mouth because I knew that my grandmother laughed and joked, but she did not play. I am from the house by the side of the road where poor hungry white people stopped to ask for food on their way anyplace else, where we were required by my grandmother to feed them even though they probably would have looked the other way had they passed us on the street or might have even pushed us off the sidewalk. This grandmother was forcing us to learn how to share with those who did not deserve our sharing. She simply said, that is not our issue. We have plenty. I am from hair grease and hot combs, from cooking on Saturday because Sunday was the Sabbath reserved for church reading the funny papers and visits with friends. I am from black educators who were paid less than their white counterparts across the tracks at the white school for white children. Grandparents who were always called by their first names by white children young enough to be their children's children. I'm from dominoes, card games, riddles, jokes, and ghost stories before we finally got our black and white TV with the rabbit ears wrapped in a aluminum foil to get our three TV channels. Channels that stopped at midnight with the playing of the national anthem. I am from a time where the white lady switchboard operator could tell you when people had left their homes because she had listened in on their phone calls. I'm from the time of the telephone party line when you, you tried to place a call and neighbors were on the same line and you could listen to their calls. I'm from a time when we still talked directly to and with each other with no knowledge of texting, Facebooking, Instagramming, messaging, Snapchatting, tweeting, or TikToking. The time when we ate ice cream cooked in a double boiler on the stove and cranked by hand in a wooden ice cream freezer filled with chunks of ice and rock salt. Yeah, I'm from a mother whose mother died in the influ influenza epidemic of 1919. A mother named Alta Thalia who sold underwear for a friend who was going off to college and never breathed a word about it 
until that friend revealed it 40 years later. A mother who cooked and served dinner to a woman and her children, though that woman had hurt her in immeasurable ways. A mother who, when asked what she thought about gay people, responded, none of us has anything to say about how we are made. None of us. This mother who loved her ch children fiercely and took some pretty remarkable stances to protect them, including answering a white school board member who asked whether she believed in integration. She responded, we want the same things for our children that you want for your children. And if it takes integration to get it, so be it. That white man thought that was the wrong answer and saw to it that my mother's teaching contract was not renewed the next year. I'm from a mother born during the depression who saved scrap aluminum foil to reuse. A mother who loved to travel, went to Germany to see the passion play, traveled with me to Hong Kong, Japan, Taiwan, Singapore, and Mexico so that she could see as much of the world as she could before glaucoma could take what remained of her vision. This mother who at age 90 got dementia from a stroke but always knew her children. This mother, Alta Thalia, who was deserted with three children to support but never gave up, and who always said wise things like, every tub has to stand on her own bottom. If in doubt, don't. Every crow thinks hers is the blackest. A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. A fool and his money are soon parted, and willful waste makes woeful want. I'm from absent Thomas, who paid attention to his three children only after the raising was done, as my grandmother had predicted. I'm from that grandmother, Florida who would take me to try on ready-made dresses to see what I liked, then take me to the fabric store to make one just like it, but better, and at a fraction of the price. This grandmother named Florida, whose mother was named Pennsylvania, had students who loved her so much, one changed her name to Florida. This grandmother named Florida, who tutored me on how to stand and what to do with my eyes and my hands when making a speech. This grandmother named Florida, who never seemed satisfied with my childhood cooking, always needed just a little more salt or just a little more sugar or just a little more of something. I am from this grandmother named Florida who constantly told me you're as good as anybody and better than most, who calmed me down on more than one occasion with, there's many a slip between the cup and the lip. This same grandmother who could give you the look, you know what I mean? A look that could stop a charging bull in his tracks, or at least I thought so. I am from Grandfather Phineas, whose father was born two years before Mr. Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, but whose family would not be told for two and a half years on Juneteenth that they were free. Free to ponder whether there was any song of their God fit to be profaned in a foreign land that hated them. I am from a Grandfather Phineas, who we call Big Daddy and whose Greek names remains a mystery to me, and who our grandmother called Mr. Gray until the day she died. This grandfather who tutored me to an A in physics, though he hadn't taught physics in 40 years. I am from those great grandparents of mine, born two years before the emancipation, who somehow knew to send their children to college, including my grandfather who had 25 cents in his pocket, when he arrived at Bishop College and did not stop until he had earned four college degrees with honors. I'm from these great grandparents, these grandparents who built a school for black children in our county and whose word was good enough for 40 years to deposit their students at colleges without funds 
until they could return home to raise the money to pay their college tuitions. I'm from an indigenous maternal great-grandmother bought or brought from the reservation in Oklahoma by a black businessman who married her and produced nine children who they sent off to college. I'm from the expectation of education that unless you were dead, you were expected to head for college. <sighs> I'm from the requirement to give back to the community. I was told if you love God, you feed his sheep. That's where I'm from. Thank you. <laughs>